very much. Um, my presentation is going to be a little bit unusual. It will stand out from the crowd, not because of the quality, but because I'm the first individual so far who does have a financial disclosure to make. Um, Charlie, in the interest of brevity, I wanted this to be my disclosure slide, but they made me, if I could get it to go. Which do I point, put this in at the last minute? Um, I am a full-time employee of Oxillium Pharmaceuticals, and I have to say then that I derive 100% of my financial support from a pharmaceutical company engaged in the treatment of Dupuytren's disease. The other way in which this talk is going to be unusual in that it's going to be the first one now that focuses on a component of Dupuytren's disease that hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention, which is the collagen portion of the extracellular matrix. So instead of talking about our product, I'm going to talk about its pharmacologic target. One of, one of the things I've learned from being a scientist in industry is that you have to very quickly shift your research interests and scientific expertise to align themselves with the business needs of the company. So that makes me... The button on, on one side, you're hitting the... Uh -huh. Button on the side? Finger. Right side, my other right. So this makes me a relative newcomer to the field of matrix biology and cell matrix interactions. Um, in that I've only been working in this field for about five years. And in addition, um, I have a very complicated subject to discuss in only 15 minutes. So you can imagine that these are the range of emotions that I've gone through over the past few weeks. So what I'd like to do with the remaining time, my intent was to give you this. <laughs> it may end up being this. So let's dive right in with something very, very simple and basic, and that is a definition of what is collagen. There are two structural features that a protein must have in order for it to be classified as a collagen. One of these is that somewhere within that molecule, there has to be a triple helical portion that's composed of three polypeptide chains. If the polypeptides are identical, it's called a homotrimer. If they're not identical, it's called a heterotrimer. Um, the reason that this triple helical structure can be maintained is the second important feature in that all collagens must contain a multiple of a triple amino acid repeat that's called a Gly XY motif. The glycine is always the first amino acid in the chain, and X and Y are usually either proline or hydroxyproline. And, and, and indeed, the concentration, the high concentration of proline and the presence of hydroxyproline are also unique to collagens. What this triple helix does to the collagen molecule is makes it extremely stable, stable once it's had a chance to form and cross-link and stabilize, so it becomes a protein that's very, very hard to make. However, conversely, because it's such a complicated structure to make and to maintain, the polypeptides are extremely unstable until they're in the final triple helical conformation and they're together in a group. So the basic things to remember about collagen is it's a protein that's hard to make and hard to break. Let's talk a little bit about collagen subtypes in, again, the 30,000 foot overview. Collagen is the product of 34 genes divided into 28 types. And depending on whose publication you read, anywhere from five to seven different classes, depending on their physical structure and also on their functional properties. The collagens of interest to us in the Dupuytren's disease field are the fibrillar collagens. And these are the ones who are triple helical from end to end. These are the primarily, primary structural extracellular matrix proteins. And indeed, the highest abundance collagen in the body is the type 1, which is a primary component of the Dupuytren's cord. Type 3 is a component with the cord, and uh, type 5 is a uh, partner in crime with the type 1 collagen and helps in forming and stabilizing the fibrils. So these are the primary structural components of the Dupuytren's cord following this fibril forming class. But equally of interest is one collagen in this network forming uh, protein cl pro uh, collagen class. And that's the type 4 collagen, because this is the protein, the, the collagen that forms the basement membranes of blood vessels, the perineurium of nerves, and also some of the basement membranes of the epithelial structures. So this is a collagen we don't want to target in Dupuytren's disease. Um, although it has a triple helical component, 
it's found on the outside of the active portion of the molecule, so it behaves a little bit differently than the fibrillar collagens that are triple helical from end to end. In order to understand the role of collagen in Dupuytren's disease, it's important to know a little bit about the collagen remodeling process. Like, although it's an extracellular matrix and it's something that should be there and fairly stable, it actually turns over consistently in response to physiologic need, uh, wound healing, and growth. Um, in normal tissues, this is a balanced process. So at the end of the day, you have a, the same amount of collagen that you started out with or collagen that's there to meet the physiologic need. And in order to make sure that the process remains balanced, both processes are highly regulated, with collagen degradation being more highly regulated for obvious <coughs> reasons. This isn't something you want to run loose un uncontrolled. The process that predominates in any physiologic situation will determine the <coughs> outcome of the remodeling process. When deposition predominates, you get a fibrotic process. When degradation predominates, you get altered wound healing, and it's also key to tumor metastasis. The process that predominates is determined by the environment. That's very important, the cells and the extracellular forces in play. Collagen synthesis or collagen deposition can basically be divided into <coughs> two phases. Or the, the way I like to think about it. Uh, collagen synthesis is what regulates the amount of collagen that's produced and laid down. Uh, the collagen is produced as monomers that are extremely unstable, just like yarn, a ball of yarn on the floor. It's very easy to tangle until you wind it up. So they are actually synthesized directly into the endoplasmic reticulum, where like <laughs> all babies, they're closely chaperoned and supervised by a protein called HSP47. And this helps to maintain the collagen monomers in an untangled state until they can be post-translationally modified on the proline and lysine residues. These <coughs> need to be hydroxylated because the cross-linking of the uh, hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine residues is the key to the triple helix formation. When the triple helix is completed, it is uh, extruded through the Golgi apparatus to the extracellular space you, via a specialized structure called a fibropositor. And there's a reason for uh, this structure being in place. It does two things. One is it ensures that the collagen fibrils are put where they are needed. And the other is it keeps the young collagen fibrils together, kind of like teenagers, they're safer in groups maybe. Um, because at this point, these fibrils are still relatively unstable. They have not undergone the final stages of uh, collagen fiber, fibril generation, and they need additional cross-linking. Once the propeptides are secreted to the extracellular space, their C and N propeptides, which again serve as chaperones, are cleaved. The second step of collagen deposition is the, the phase called fibro collagen fibrillogenesis. And this process is where the stability and the size and the shape of the ultimate collagen fibril is regulated. Now, once the propeptides are cleaved, the fibrils can self-assemble into the larger fibrils, which is something that everybody in this audience that has worked with collagen gels has taken advantage of. However, the process goes a lot more smoothly if it's chaperoned, and <coughs> this is the role of fibronectin, collagen 5, and certain, cellular, uh, certain cell surface integrins, particularly alpha-2, beta-1, and alpha-5, beta-1. Um, and uh, additional cross-linking via lysyl oxidase also occurs here. Collagen degradation is equally highly regulated. Uh, once again, once these final fibrils are formed, the triple helical structure, the cross links, and some glycosylation protect the collagen from degradation. In order for it to be degraded, there are three steps that are critical to the process. The protease involved needs to be able to bind to the collagen, unwind the collagen, and cleave the collagen. Now, of these three activities, the first two are absolutely critical to the effectiveness of the process. In order to call an enzyme a collagenase, it has to be proven that it can effectively do all three of the steps. Only two mammalian enzyme classes have been shown to have this activity, and the primary player in this is the subset of metalloproteinases known as matrix metalloproteinases, 
although there is limited uh, collagenolysis that occurs via cathepsins L and K that's usually very specialized and doesn't have much of a role in the matrix as we know it in Dupuytren's disease. As I said before, collagen is hard to make, it's equally hard to break. In the triple helical conformation, it's stable. It has to be unwound and cleaved. Once that initial cleavage occurs, the product is known as gelatin. Gelatin is highly unstable and can actually denature at body temperature. It will actually melt. Um, additional degradation by the gelatinolytic MMPs occurs and other proteases such as trypsin and thymine pepsidases can also denature these collagen peptides. And they can also undergo phagocytosis <coughs> by fibroblasts and the macrophages. So you've got a cell that can actually lay the protein down and also degrade it as, as necessary. And that will be a little bit important when we look at the role in Dupuytren's disease a little bit <coughs> later on. Regulation of collagen remodeling, three places. The collagen deposition stages, these are the steps at which uh, regulation occurs. Um, if the, the level of expression of the collagen genes determines how much is deposited, how fast they move through the fibroblast, and this is again a function of the HSP47 chaperoning, how well they're cross-linked, and how well uh, the fibril uh, fibrillogenesis occurs extracellularly. Collagen degradation, is regulated by the levels of the collagenolytic enzymes. And also, these are normally secreted in an inactive state, so you need other enzymes to activate them before they can work. Um, they're also very rapidly inactivated. This isn't a process that you want to go on unchecked, or we'd all be bowls of gelatin on the floor here. And in addition, cathepsins have a strict acid pH requirement. But in addition, collagen itself has the ability to regulate its degree of degradation and stability. Uh, more efficient fibrillogenesis that results in larger fibrils renders the collagen much more resistant to degradation. The enzymes can't get into the middle of something that's big. Other proteins that associate with collagen can protect it from degradation. And also, interestingly, mechanical tension on collagen renders it in, uh, less susceptible to cleavage by collagenases. This has been shown using clostridial collagenase as a model, but it is undoubtedly equally true for MMPs. Whoops, which is backwards. Got it. Now, the role of collagen in Dupuytren's disease basically depends on how you think about the pathogenesis. And I'm not even going to go into Charlie's figure from this morning with the growth factors and whatever. This is how my simplistic mind looks at the two hypotheses. You can either look at Dupuytren's contracture or Dupuytren's disease as an, imba an unbalance in the process of degradation and deposition. And if this is your thought process, you've got ample evidence to support you. This is a collation from the literature of a number of gene changes that indicate that there are alterations in the collagen remodeling process. And if you notice by looking through these, the um, most of the ones that are upregulated are those that would increase either collagen synthesis, such as the uh, collagen 1A1, 1A2, and 3A2 genes that are upregulated, or enhance fibrillogenesis, will stabilize the collagen once it's secreted. And that's the role of the uh, alpha 5 beta 1 integrin. Fibronectin helps to stabilize collagen, and um, lysoloxidase 2 helps to increase the extracellular cross linking. So all of these enhance collagen, either synthesis or degradation. Um, conversely, you'll see a downregulation of MMP3, which is a collagenase, and TIMP1 is upregulated, which is a protein that would uh, inhibit MMPs. So there's ample evidence that this is a player in the, that increased an imbalance in uh, the remodeling process has a role in Dupuytren's disease. What if you think about it a little bit differently, as we've heard this morning, where Dupuytren's disease is basically an example of wound healing gone bad? And I like to think of this as, in this circumstance, collagen has a role as a signal transducer in Dupuytren's disease. When a team of people are playing tug of war, their response to knowing that the game has started and the game is in process is the tension on the rope. Collagen is the rope. As we've heard very elegantly this morning, fibroblasts respond to stresses that are put on them. 
And the way you play the, win the game, if you know that you're under duress, is you recruit more players, which is fibroblasts transforming to myofibroblasts. And the guys you have need to hold on tighter and pull harder, which is the differentiation of the myofibroblasts, the increase of the actin complexes, the increased actin fibers, which allow these guys to pull a lot harder. Most of these responses are mediated by the interaction of these fibroblasts with collagen and their ability to sense the increased tension in the extracellular space through collagen fibrils. So what else can you do if you want to win the game of tug of war? You can strengthen the rope. We've already seen that. Increased collagen synthesis, making the fibers thicker, making them less elastic. You can't play tug of war with a bungee cord. Increase their resistance to degradation, either by uh, making them uh, stronger or by increasing the tension on them. Increase the cross links and maintain the collagen under stress. The harder these myofibroblasts pull, the more stressed the collagen. You can also shorten the rope, or let's put it another way, cut the rope and tie knots in it. And this speaks to Dr. Hinz's point this morning, where there is a short-term localized upregulation of MMPs that allows local, next to the myofibroblast, degradation and remodeling of the collagen. It's not a new idea. As you can see, it's been around since 1981 that the mechanism of the contracture mediated by collagen has to do with this focal uh, MMP-driven remodeling of the collagen, breakdown and resynthesis in C2 uh, as part of the process. Now, we talked this morning a little bit about short-term contractions of the cells, and that really isn't enough time to uh, remodel the, the protein. Well, there's some evidence from the literature that at least for clostridial collagenase, the initial action of collagenase on those fibro, on the fi collagen fibrils actually increases their elasticity and will therefore make them more susceptible to degradation. So it could very easily be all you've got to do is stop pulling long enough for the MMPs to start doing their work and this process can occur very efficiently even in the face of tension. Is there evidence for this? Absolutely. Um, this looks like the same table you saw before, and in large measure it is, but it helps to explain some of the uh, conflicting data that's been seen in these gene studies of, of uh, College of Dupuytren's disease, where you have both upregulation and downregulation of MMPs. Uh, specifically, I'd like to point out to you the uh, MMPs 1, 13, and 14 are upregulated in Dupuytren's nodules. And uh, these would increase collagen degradation. 14 in particular makes sure that collagen degradation and MMP activation is local. It occurs at one site on the, because this is a transmembrane MMP that keeps the degradation in one spot near the cell membrane. Uh, periostin is a, is a compound that's primary function is to strengthen the rope. It will increase the fiber diameter and length and also by being a co-player with collagen decreases its elasticity. So is collagen a valid target in Dupuytren's disease? That's, I think that, in my opinion, is its third role in this process. And it doesn't matter whether you think of this disease as an imbalance in uh, collagen remodeling or is wound healing gone that bad. There's equal validity in either cutting the rope to relieve the tension or physically remove it. Weakening the rope to either by either physically removing it or degrading it. We're changing the rope into a rubber band so that it stops pulling on myofibroblasts. I'll reserve questions for the discussion session. Thank you.